Good morrow, friends. This is Jordan, and you're listening to Not Strictly History. Hello and welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of Not Strictly History. Real talk. Every single time I say to you guys, hello and welcome to another episode of Not Strictly History, I'm slightly afraid that the Ryan Bergara in me is going to come out and I'm going to be saying hello and welcome to another edition of BuzzFeed Unsolved. It hasn't happened yet, um, but if it does happen someday, that's why. I love BuzzFeed Unsolved. I love Shane and Ryan. I love their new company, Watcher. I love them. I love them so much. In fact, I've been watching BuzzFeed Unsolved again recently because it's been a long time. And it has been, in a word, delightful. And um, there's really no reason for me to be talking about this whatsoever, um, except for the fact that it's the truth because they're awesome. So let us continue on. As always, I am really, really excited to be here today. And here's the thing, everybody. I have to start off this episode by saying that there is so much going on. There is so much going on in this episode. It's probably... it. It will probably be our longest episode. I know I said that last time, but it probably will be, to be honest. I have a very long group of notes going on, and it'll probably take me a couple of sessions of sitting down to record it, to be honest. There's just so much happening. I've done so much research. It took me forever to write, but I really hope that I've, you know, made it good, (laughs) for lack of better words. I really, really hope that I've put it together in a way that makes sense. How about that? That's more eloquent. So here's the thing, everyone. When you first start to actually learn history the way that it should be learned, so usually in college for all of my Americans out there, you learn pretty much right off the bat that history is entirely more complicated than you were ever led to believe. This is actually what makes history a very challenging field Very few things are strictly fact, to be honest. History takes a lot of analysis, research, time, and understanding. We don't know the things we know about the past just because of record keeping. Now, obviously, that is a huge part of it, but it does take work. Now, I have a really interesting story to tell you about this. Once upon a time during my undergrad, I was sitting in a history class And at the beginning of every class, this particular professor would say, hey, does anybody have anything they'd like to say? Any questions from last lecture? Like, open up the floor for a couple of minutes. And this kid, this kid raises his hand and he starts going off about how hard this class is, how it's definitely graduate level, how he can't believe all the reading we have to do how the level of analysis is ridiculous. Like, he is going off. And then he says the magic words. I'm a political science major. And if I hadn't been so wildly uncomfortable at his outburst, I probably would have laughed out loud because then I'm looking around at all of my fellow history majors and all of us are just sitting there like, okay, welcome to history, my dude. Like... I, I don't I don't understand. And that sounds really snobby. And I don't mean it to sound snobby. Like, the poor guy. Hopefully he ended the semester okay. Like, God bless political science major. Dude. But the point of this whole story is that being a historian is actually really hard work. And you don't really understand that until you have to try doing it, to be honest. It is much harder work than you would ever think from the outset. And the work that historians do can have huge consequences and a lasting impact. But that's probably a tangent for another time. All of this to say, everybody, that today's episode was really challenging for me to write. More so than any other episode I've written so far for this podcast, this episode has so much going on. You can't tell the main story without telling a million side stories. Believe me, I tried. The level of research I had to do for this episode took me on a trip. Not just one trip, several trips. And this is saying a lot because, as you know, 
I've already mentioned several times throughout this season how much deeper into my research I've been getting and all of the things I've been learning and digging into. So all of this is relevant in this episode times like 10 at least. Not only did the research take me a million places and take quite a while to finish, so did writing the episode itself because I want to paint both an accurate and clear picture and with all the moving parts it could it could in fact, it was really, really difficult to do both. So here we are, and we're going to try to do it. Again, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, I really, really hope that I did it. I hope that I was able to paint a good picture for all of you. But we're going to find out. So, come one, come all. Today, the Wayback Machine is taking us to colonial America. Because we're talking about the Boston Tea Party. It's true. Secure your nearest tea bag, please, because it just might get tossed overboard. We have a long, long journey to take. Let's begin. Just to reiterate, in case you weren't listening a few seconds ago or failed to read the title of this episode, our subject today is the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party is a quite well-known event in history. Most of us have, at one time or another, heard of it. The fact of the matter is that the Boston Tea Party was actually a huge deal. A much bigger deal, actually, than we even think about it being. And that is, of course, because of its role in leading to the American Revolution. I'm really excited to talk about the Boston Tea Party today for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons is because of what I touched on in the beginning of this episode. This event, more so than anything else we've talked about, really demonstrates how intertwined everything in history is. It really demonstrates just what it means to truly study history and attempt to understand something. Because you cannot fully understand the Boston Tea Party or its ramifications unless you understand the many things that came before it as well as the incredible impact that it caused. So, the Boston Tea Party itself took place on December 16th, 1773. But the road leading up to the Boston Tea Party begins much earlier. In fact, it begins about eight years earlier, to be exact. The road to the Boston Tea Party began when the British Parliament decided to pass a little something known as the Stamp Act of 1765. It was a big deal, okay? The Stamp Act was the very first internal tax levied directly on the American colonists by the British Parliament. The Act imposed a tax on all paper documents in the colonies. And listen, I don't even know where to begin with everything that that would entail, so you can probably imagine why this act was a little upsetting to the colonists. So, the question is, why would Parliament pass an act that seems so ridiculous? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess it depends on how you look at it, their reasoning actually makes sense looking back. So come with me on this. Okay, follow me here. The Stamp Act was passed because at this time, England was very deep in debt from the French and Indian War, which took place between 1756 and 1763. Because of this debt, they began looking to the North American colonies as a revenue source. And before you even ask, the answer is yes. We are going to stop and briefly discuss the French and Indian War. Do you see what I'm talking about with the intertwining events here? It, this is only the beginning, my friends, okay? So, the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War in Europe, I'm more inclined to call it the Seven Years' War myself, but that's a story for another time, this war ended the rivalry between France and Britain for control of North America. So this left Britain in possession of not only the American colonies, but Canada as well, which also meant that now France had no foothold in North America. So this was a huge victory for Britain, but this victory also brought with it massive debt. And here's the thing. The American colonists had been subject to sporadic warfare and violence with their French neighbors for over 80 years. So this victory was very, very good for them as well. Parliament looked at this fact and realized that 
the American colonists benefited just as much or probably more from this victory as anybody else in the British Empire. And so they decided that these colonists should shoulder a part of the burden of the war's costs. So part of the revenue generated from this act was set to go towards maintaining several regiments of British soldiers in North America who would help maintain peace between Native Americans and colonists. Um, I'm going to add an allegedly right there. I have a problem with the whole, hey, let's bring soldiers in to maintain peace between the Americans and the Native Americans. Um, I just, you know what, that's a story for another time too. Let's continue. So there was also a lot more to the Stamp Act that angered colonists. For example, colonial juries were notoriously reluctant to find smugglers guilty of their crimes. As part of this act, it was passed that anybody who violated the Stamp Act could be tried and convicted without a local jury in the Vice Admiralty Courts. The fact of the matter, everybody, is that Britain had long regulated colonial trade through a system of restrictions of duties on imports and exports. However, during the first half of the 1700s, the enforcement had been very, very lax. So at this time, smuggling is just thriving and the people didn't really care because it, all of it was pretty loose and not a big deal. Hence, why juries weren't really worried about it as far as legal matters went. Like, we're all good here. But at this time, Britain began to change their tune with a different act that was passed in 1764. Don't worry, we won't talk about it because there's already a lot going on. But this act put duties on sugar and other goods and also made it so that other laws were now actually being enforced which also angered the colonists. So shortly after the act of the sugar, the sugar act, the British Lord of the Treasury and Prime Minister George Grenville proposed the Stamp Act and it was passed without debate. However, our good old colonists saw the Stamp Act as unconstitutional. The first reason being that it was taxation without representation. This is the part where I invite you to take a shot every single time I say the phrase taxation without representation, because this, my friends, is really the whole reason that the American colonists decided to just make their own country. They woke up one day and said, hey, why England? Because of taxation. I mean, that's very oversimplified, but anyway, so they argued that only their own representative assemblies could tax them. They then resorted to mob violence to intimidate Stamp Act tax collectors into resigning. Parliament passed the Stamp Act on March 22, 1765, and they repealed it just a year later in 1766. However, along with this repeal, they also issued a declaratory act that reaffirmed that they did, in fact, have the authority to pass any colonial legislation that they saw fit. So basically, they're saying to the American colonists, OK, we're repealing this act. You're getting you're getting what you want in this moment, but you are not the winner here. We're still going to pass whatever law we want to. So if you thought that Parliament had learned their lesson with this, the Stamp Act, think again. Just a year after repealing the Stamp Act, they decided to make good on their little, hey, we're still able to tax you or do whatever we want threat thing. And they decided to enact more taxes. Which brings us to the Townsend Revenue Act of 1767. This act was insane. And I'm going to tell you why. This act placed a tax on tea, glass, lead, oil, paint, and paper. As you can probably imagine, this made those of us here in the colonies a little bit upset. And immediately, the implementation of this act was met with heavy boycotts and protests. This leads us to yet another important event that we need to discuss, which is the Boston Massacre. 
Now, I'm willing to bet that many of you haven't heard of the Boston Massacre, even if you know quite a bit about the Boston Tea Party or these various acts. It's not super well known, but the truth is that the Boston Massacre is of at least equal importance to the Boston Tea Party and is actually cited by many historians as another separate event that led to the American Revolution. But for our purposes, we're just going to focus on what it was, how it occurred, who was impacted, and why this event led to the Boston Tea Party. Now, it's highly likely that at this point in the episode, you are asking yourself or shouting at me or whatever, why Boston? What is all of the significance of Boston? And if you weren't asking that before, you're probably at least curious now, so I will tell you the answer. The city of Boston was incredibly influential in the years leading up to the American Revolution, as well as during and after the Revolution. It isn't something that we're really often taught, or, you know, at least I wasn't over here in Idaho, but Boston was a center of revolutionary thought and feeling. And without this city and the events that occurred there, it's really hard to say how the American Revolution would look. I think it would look very different than it does. Ever since the French and Indian War, Boston had been known as a hotbed of radicalism. People there had new and, you know, seemingly dangerous ideas, you know, like independence, and they weren't um, afraid to speak out about them. And, And more than speak out about them, they weren't afraid to do something about them. And this fact is what eventually led both let, well, you know, it led to a lot of things, but both to the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. And I think we could even say to the American Revolution. So we can pretty safely say that Boston was particularly upset about the Townsend Act, or maybe not even more so than all the other colonies, but they were just perhaps more vocal about their disagreement and their unwillingness to follow this law. For example, in, pro, in order to protest these taxes, the patriots in Boston would vandalize stores selling British goods. They would intimidate store merchants and their customers. And obviously the crown wasn't cool with this, but I just have to say, that's not cool, bro. The merchant is just doing his best, so maybe you should chillax. I don't know. Again, the crown wasn't cool with this. So... In early 1770, they sent a regiment of 2,000 British soldiers into the city of Boston to occupy it. And they were charged with enforcing various acts, such as the Townsend Revenue Act. Now, listen to this. At this time, the total population of Boston was only 16,000 people. So a regiment of 2,000 soldiers was quite a big thing, and the people were not into it. We'll say that. In fact, it's time to talk to you about a man that you maybe have heard of before. The one and only Mr. Paul Revere. Yeah, here we go. Paul Revere is, of course, mostly remembered for his midnight ride. You know, one if by land, two if two if by sea, blah, blah. But he did a lot of other interesting things that you probably didn't know about. For example, did you know that Paul Revere was an incredible artist, and not just any kind of artist, everybody. He did copper engravings and was also a master at propaganda. So, when the British regiment came into Boston to enforce all these laws, Paul Revere started turning out propaganda like nobody's business. All of it portrayed Boston as a righteous, good place that was being oppressed and ill-treated by a brutal army of British regulars. So... The soldiers have showed up to enforce the Townsend Revenue Act. There is this anti-British propaganda flying everywhere and an already pretty politically radical place. So I think that we can safely assume that it makes sense that skirmishes between colonists and soldiers and patriots and loyalists were becoming increasingly common. In other words, Boston was just a powder keg begging for a spark. Now remember, everybody... We are in early 1770 at this point. And speaking of sparks flying, let's travel to February 22nd. A mob of patriots began attacking the store of a well-known loyalist by throwing rocks through the windows. A customs officer who lived near the store by the name of Ebenezer Richardson 
attempted to break up the crowd by firing his gun through his window. Um, I, I, um I'm just going to say it. I, I don't think it's the best idea to break up mob violence by shooting a firearm. Maybe that's a stretch. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let me know. This shot, unfortunately, struck and killed an 11-year-old boy named Christopher Sider. And as you can imagine, this only brought further rage to literally everyone. Several days later, another fight broke out between local workers and the British soldiers. This fight ended in even more bloodshed, which in turn caused more anger. So we're not a powder keg waiting for a spark anymore. We're a bomb about to go off, people. Things are really escalating. And this brings us to the cold, snowy evening of March 5th, 1770. A man by the name of Private Hugh White was the only soldier standing guard of the King's money at the Custom House on King Street in Boston. He's just sitting there minding his own business, guarding the money. He's a private, okay? He's just doing his freaking job, all right? And soon, a mob of angry colonists shows up. They start insulting him and threatening violence. White eventually fought back, and he struck a colonist with his bayonet. The colonists responded by pelting him with snowballs, ice, and stones. And this is when bells begin ringing throughout the town, which is usually a warning for fire. So this starts sending a mass of men into the streets. The assault on Private White continued, and he eventually fell and called for reinforcements. The reinforcements came in response to his plea, fearing a mass riot and the loss of the king's money, which is fair. A man by the name of Captain Thomas arrived with the soldiers, and they took up a defensive position in front of the custom house. Now listen, there's a lot of differing reports as to what happened next, okay? It's a little shoddy. Reportedly, some colonists felt that bloodshed was inevitable, and they pleaded with the soldiers to hold their fire, while other colonists dared them to shoot. Captain later, the Captain Thomas, excuse me, he later said that a colonist told him that the protesters planned to, quote, carry off White from his post and probably murder him. We don't love that. So this violence is escalating quickly. The colonists are hitting soldiers with clubs and sticks. And again, reports differ widely on what happened next. However, allegedly someone said, fire, and a soldier fired. It is unclear whether or not it was intentional. But once the first shot was let off, other soldiers started firing. This killed five colonists and wounded six. Those who were killed include a man by the name of Crispus Attucks. He was a biracial dock worker, and he is known as the very first American colonist killed in the Revolution. There was also a man named Samuel Gray, who was a rope maker. And at the end of this, it was discovered that he had a hole in his head the size of a fist. Sailor James Caldwell was hit twice before dying. And two men by the name of Samuel Maverick and Patrick Carr were both mortally wounded. Within hours, Captain Thomas Preston and his men were arrested and jailed. And at this time, like, it's only been a couple hours and propaganda is already raging. As you can probably imagine, all of these events greatly fanned the flames of anti-British sentiment in Boston. Here's the thing, whether or not it was strictly because of these events or the culmination of all the anger the American colonies felt about the Townsend Revenue Act, I don't really know. But later that year, the taxes from the Townsend Revenue Act were repealed. All of the commodities were freed from the taxes placed upon them by this act. All of the commodities except tea. The, tea, the tax on tea was kept in place because, again, Parliament was not letting the colonists forget that they did have the right to tax them. So, there's clearly a lot going on here. And I don't know which side isn't learning their lesson. Either Parliament needs to realize that they can't just tax without representation, or the colonists have to bow down to the will of the parent country. Um, I think we all know how that turned out.
we are now going to jump ahead just a little bit. Two years to 1772. November of 1772, to be exact. It is time to talk about something that was a lot more official than mob rule or intimidation. Because up to this point, it kind of sounds like that's all the colonists are doing in order to protest and show their frustration. And obviously there has been a lot of that. But the colonists also wanted to go about things legally and diplomatically. They wanted to do things right, essentially. So, in order to help facilitate this, something called the Committee of Correspondence was formed in Boston in November of 1772. This was, of course, a committee. Creating a committee in response to actions from Britain was not unheard of in the colonies. Okay, that's important to know. The colonies had long been forming and using committees in order to deal with issues between the colonists and Britain. For example, Boston formed a committee in 1764 to garner opposition to the Currency Act, and New York had formed one to oppose the Stamp Act. However, the difference here is that these committees were temporary. They were formed for a purpose and then dissolved when the issue at hand was resolved. The Committee of Correspondence was similar to these earlier committees, but it had lasting plans. It was ready for commitment, if you know what I mean. In the simplest terms, the Boston Committee of Correspondence was essentially a kind of standing provincial government, a way for the people to communicate their needs, their needs and views in a formal legal setting. This does not mean that mob rule and intimidation and all of that jazz stopped because it didn't, but the Committee of Correspondence is a really big deal. The amazing part of the story is that while Boston was the very first city to create a Committee of Correspondence, all of the other colonies soon followed their example. Eventually, Committees of Correspondence existed in, they existed pretty much everywhere, all over the colonies, and they also acted as a network for information, which was incredibly important. Committees of Correspondence rallied colonial opposition against British policy and established a political union among the 13 colonies, which is really what makes revolution possible, right? You cannot, you cannot declare independence unless you're all on the same page. And here's the thing, the structure of colonial society both influenced and contributed to the establishment of the committees of correspondence. Individual towns had an environment of cooperation and a degree of discipline to them. Um, it was really, I mean, listen, this probably wouldn't have been super feasible, except in the social, political, spiritual and dynamic environments under which these particular communities thrived. The close mutual association of the towns and the influence of things like town meetings and the clergy, and later the newspapers also created an atmosphere in which all of this cooperation was just really nourished. Thus, when the committees of correspondence were created, they had they were basically just created for this, this willing populace, and they had a really big and profound impact on stirring everybody into collective action. So the committees of correspondence are, were, are, you can really call them the voice of the patriots. Committees of correspondence were formed in cities and regions throughout the colonies. The most influential committees of correspondence were in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. And there, my friends, we have a very quick lowdown on the committees of correspondence. But, like I mentioned, the very first one was formed in Boston in 1772, and the other committees that were formed throughout the colonies came later. So the very first standing committee of correspondence was formed by Samuel Adams and 20 other Patriot leaders in November of 1772 in Boston in response to the Gatsby Affair, which happened the previous June in Rhode Island. The purpose of the Boston Committee of Correspondence was to, quote, prepare a statement of the rights of the colonists and of this province in particular as men, as Christians, and as subjects, 
prepare a declaration of the infringement of those rights and prepare a letter to be sent to all of the towns of this province and to the world, giving the sense of this town, end quote. It's really important for me to say right here that there's a lot of quotes. That's actually not important. What's important is that one thing I love about the writing at this time is the random, the random capitals, okay? Prepare a letter to be sent. Prepare has a, has a capital P. There's no reason for it to. It just does. And we're going to cite some letters and stuff later. They were just randomly capitalizing words. I think we should bring that back. Anyway, let's continue. Samuel Adams, Dr. Joseph Warren, James Otis, and other patriot leaders in Boston recognized the importance of collective resistance, the power of correspondence, and the vital significance of town meetings. So the committees of correspondence and things known as the Committee of Safety, especially in Massachusetts, were influential in organizing and training and arming patriot militias and establishing companies of Minutemen prior to the outbreak of the revolution. The committees of correspondence provided political organization that was necessary to unite the colonies in opposition to Britain. At this time, they're just this loose collection of regions, essentially. So they need some kind of thing to bring them together. And that's what the committees of correspondence were. As a political entity, the committees of correspondence were replaced during the war by the more formal and qualified provincial congresses, though they still continued to function locally. And here's the other thing, my friends, this is so crucial to know. The committees of correspondence really could not claim to be the voice of the majority of the colonists in the 13 colonies. It's just that their voice was the loudest and most broadcast of all the factions. In fact, in July of 1774, in Worcester, Massachusetts, which was a hotbed of Patriot support at this time, a letter was signed by 52, quote, free men, stating that the committees of correspondence were rebellious. This letter says in part, quote, the committees of correspondence in the several towns of this province being creatures of modern invention and constituted as they be, are a public grievance having no legal foundation contrived by a particular faction to serve particular designs and purposes of their own, and that they, as they have been and now are managed in this town, are a nuisance, end quote. Whoa, throwing some serious shots there, guys. We're calling them a nuisance, so, and a public grievance. Shots fired. Here's the thing. It was actually really easy to form and establish a local committee of correspondence because it was just a thing. Roughly 7,000 to 8,000 patriots served as delegates at local, at the local and colonial level on various committees of correspondence. So the, these things are a big deal, okay? They, they really are. The patriots realized that in order to gain popular support, they needed to split the strength of the towns away from British rule. They needed to gain influence in town meetings across Massachusetts. Here's the thing. I've been saying that a lot, but here's the thing, okay? Massachusetts at this time was primarily dominated by loyalists. The number of Patriot supporters was growing rapidly, but it was still mostly loyalists, okay? So they needed these committees of correspondence, particularly in Massachusetts, in order to gain this kind of foothold. So in Boston, in November, on November 2nd of 1772, they organized a town meeting and garnered enough support to vote in a, revolution, a resolution, excuse me, to create a standing committee of correspondence, which was huge for Boston. Okay, so fun fact, everybody, about Jordan. When I was in high school, I competed in competitive speech tournaments all the time. And not to toot my own horn, but I was pretty good. However, the reason I'm bringing this up is because there were a couple of times in my speech career where I noticed I would start talking really, really fast. This was either because I was nervous and didn't want to be there, or it was because I was just really excited about what I was talking about. And it, it was a whole thing. I've noticed 
the reason that I bring this up is because I've noticed I'm talking kind of fast in this episode. I'm going to try and slow down just a little bit. However, it's again, it's because I'm so excited. It's because there's a lot to get through. There's a lot of information. But again, I'm going to slow down because you guys do not have the luxury of researching this and writing it with me. So I'm going to slow down just a little bit as much as I can. We're going to we're going to do our best here. So we have talked about the committees of correspondence, and we also talked about how these committees and how how committees at the time um, were very common for just settling random problems. So the forming of a committee to deal with something was a pretty standard thing to have happen at this time. However, the committee of correspondence is different, again, because it's not going to dissolve. And it actually inspired many others just like it to pop all over the country. We've talked about that extensively as well. That's also clearly significant, very significant. So, you know, them creating a committee isn't out of the blue, but the type of committee that they're creating is a really big deal. And if you are asking yourself, why would a committee of more importance need to be formed? Never fear. I do have the answer. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that the original Committee of Correspondence was created in Boston by Patriot leaders in response to an event, an event known as the Gatsby Affair. As with so many things, we could definitely do an entire episode on this one event itself. But as you know, that is not the purpose of our gathering together today. So, I'm going to give you the summarized version. And yes, okay, I can hear a handful of you asking if this is strictly necessary. And the answer is absolutely. So get out your notebooks and take some notes. There will be a quiz later. The Gatsby Affair occurred in June of 1772, again in Rhode Island. British officers charged with enforcing customs laws and the Stamp Act were becoming, in a word, aggressive. This event demonstrates the severity of this crisis pretty well. Lieutenant William Duddingston, excuse me, of Her Majesty's ship, the Gatsby, was charged with patrolling the waters of Narragansett Bay off Rhode Island. He had a reputation, quote, as an overzealous enforcer. He often stops ships really for no reason. Um, and especially ships that had already properly passed customs in Newport. He would board and detain vessels, he would confiscate cargoes, often without charge and without recourse for the merchants whose goods were impounded. The losses were mounting, and it was widely believed that these harassments were directed specifically at various patriots. So on June 9, 1772, a packet sloop by the name of Hannah captained by a Captain Lindsay, deliberately lured the Gatsby across the shallows of Namquid Point, now known as Gatsby Point. They left the Gatsby there and went on to Providence. Captain Lindsay told John Brown, who was a prominent and respected merchant in Rhode Island, who sent out a town crier inviting all interested parties to meet at Sabin's Tavern, to plan the Gatsby's destruction. Because guess what, my friends? They led the Gatsby out to these shallow waters and it ran aground and it was very stuck. And so the captain goes and tells this really important dude, hey, the ship is really super stuck. And he goes, OMG, this is just what we need. Let's get everybody together and destroy the boat. So under the leadership of a man named Abraham Whipple, 55 men planned an attack on the ship. This crowd of men took eight longboats with muffled oars to the stranded ship on the following evening, June 10th, 1772. This group surrounded and boarded the Gatsby. They wounded Duddingston and captured the entire crew. All of them were hauled ashore and abandoned to watch as the Gatsby was looted and burned. The ship was burned all the way to the water line where it thereafter exploded because the fire hit the powder keg. Listen, okay, listen. This whole thing is wild any way you look at it, but it's even crazier because none of these attackers attempted to hide their identities, okay? 
It was just bold as brass, okay? Duddingston and the crew were able to point out most of the participants readily. However, this did them little to no good because the local courts were also antagonistic towards the Royal Navy. So, get this. Instead of prosecuting the attackers, charges were brought against Duddingston for illegal seizure of goods. I need so many applause for this pettiness. I need it so much. This is fabulous in every way. However, as you can probably imagine, this news outraged Parliament. So they set up a special commission to, they sent them to Boston, Newport, you know, the colonies. They sent them to go and apprehend the attackers and take them back to England for trial. Even though the identity of the ta- of all of these attackers were widely known, the investigation was fruitless and no arrests were ever made. Even though the Crown had offered a large reward for the names to be officially reported, they never were. Not, everybody knew who had participated, but nobody was willing to put to point people out and officially put them on record. So this whole thing was fruitless and nobody ever got in trouble for it, which is iconic in every single way. Okay, so there you have your very brief summary of the Gatsby affair. And as you can see, this was significant for many, many reasons, but namely because we have the colonists retaliating against mistreatment in a very, very significant way. Here's the thing, the people knew that this would bring repercussions serious repercussions, which we, sh- we saw that it very much did or nearly did. So it makes sense that they wanted to establish a committee to work as a middleman between the people and the crown during this rather explosive issue. It all, it's all coming together, right? So the first communication of the Boston Committee of Correspondence was sent out to towns, and it was a list of, uh, excuse me, towns all across Massachusetts, not just in Boston. And it was a list of grievances that they had with Britain and a request that these views be endorsed by the whole colony. Accompanying this list of grievances was a request that asked for blank, blank, why did I say that? Uh, Excuse me, was a request that asked for, quote, a free communication of your sentiment to this town of our common danger, end quote. I'm still laughing. I don't know why I said that. Let me get it together. <clears throat> so, this list contained the following grievances. Quote, British Parliament has assumed power of legislation for the colonists without their consent. Parliament has raised illegal revenues. Tax collectors have been appointed by the Crown, a right reserved for the province. Tax collectors are entrusted with power too absolute and arbitrary. Private premises are exposed to search. Fleets and armies are quartered on the townsfolk in times of peace without their consent. Tax revenue has been used by the king to pay provincial government officers, making them dependent on him in violation of the charter. General assemblies are forced to meet in inconvenient places. Activities of the council have been limited. Colonists accused of crimes are to be tried in admiralty courts. Restraints are placed against iron mills, hat manufacture, and transport. Wool cannot be carried over a ferry. Many other businesses are curtailed. Colonists accused of destroying any British naval property are to be transported to England for trial. Parliament is attempting to establish an American episcopate. Parliament is making frequent alteration of the bounds of the colonies, not according to charter. End quote. So after issuing this list, the majority of the towns in Massachusetts took stock in the example set by Boston and they established their own network of committees of correspondence throughout Massachusetts. The name Committee of Correspondence also helped garner support during this radical period. Because again, even though committees weren't a new thing, standing committees were a new thing, and it was very radical. So the word committee isn't necessarily an authoritative word, and it also carries more power in it carried a lot more power in the minds of the colonists than a request from a single representative or town would have, which makes total sense. So in the spring of 1773, 
they had committees of correspondence established in Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. By February of 1774, 11 colonies had established networks of committees of correspondence. The word network is important here because the two colonies that are left out of this still had committees of correspondence, meaning that every colony had these committees. They may just not have been as connected in the network for a variety of reasons. So in terms of power, by early 1774, the committees of correspondence had superseded the colonial legislature and royal officials in the colonies. Committees of correspondence were influential in revolu revolutionizing the town meeting, which, guys, the town meeting was a huge deal back then, okay? It was more than just discussions of local matters. It was more into far-reaching global politics. The town meeting became so much more than it even was. It became this action level for the Patriot cause. It was a means for the citizenry to voice their opinions about the grievances that they had with Britain. And because the committees of correspondence were becoming more powerful, when the people voiced their opinions about this, they knew that the committees were listening. They knew that it wasn't just them voicing an opinion into air and you know letting it go away. It was, it was gonna do something. The primary function of the Committees of Correspondence was the championing and implementation of the Patriot cause through diplomatic means, which is very important. The network of Committees of Correspondence served as a pipeline for information that was transmitted to all of the colonies. They were essentially a very well-calculated Patriot network for the dissemination of news and information as it related to the grievances with Britain from the major cities to rural communities. They made sure that this news was always accurate and that it reflected the views of local parent governments on particular issues. Also, the colonial interpretation of British policy and that this information went to the proper factions. Information was usually disseminated by pamphlets and letters carried by post writers or on a ship. And again, also newspapers began to form for this as well. The Boston Committee of Correspondence, for example, relied on the Boston Gazette and Massachusetts Spy as a means of disseminating inform information regarding the Patriot cause and various grievances with Britain. The Committees of Correspondence also promoted local manufacturing and essentially said, don't buy British, which is hysterical, but also not. The goal of the committees of correspondence throughout the 13 colonies was to inform voters of the common threat that they faced, which was Britain. And a majority of the members of the committees of correspondence all throughout the colonies were also sons of liberty. They set up different espionage networks to identify disloyal elements and disenfranchised royal officials. And before you start freaking out, everybody, I can hear you. So... We're, we're good. I can hear you w saying to me, wait, wait, sons of liberty, question mark? Don't worry. Don't worry, because we are now at a spot in the episode where we must talk about another equally important group that was thriving in the American colonies at this time, the sons of liberty. You may or may not have heard of them. But the fact of the matter is that they really go hand in hand with the committees of correspondence because, again, most men were a part of both groups. Now, listen, listen very, very importantly, very well. The Sons of Liberty were, were different from the committees of correspondence, okay? They were the less legal diplomatic side. They were this, essentially, they were a well-organized patriot paramilitary political organization. However, they were shrouded in secrecy. Secrecy. Air bunnies, okay. Everybody knew about the Sons of Liberty. They were established to undermine British rule in colonial America. Listen, the committees of correspondence are the more legal, diplomatic, practical side of things. And the Sons of Liberty are the guys who kind of work in the shadows. Okay, that's the, that's the short version. The origins and founding of the Sons of Liberty are really unclear. 
The earliest known references to the organization are in, was in 1765 in Boston and in New York. It's very likely that these chapters were deliberately established at the same time and worked as an underground network in conjunction with each other. It is believed that the Sons of Liberty were formed out of earlier, smaller scale Patriot organizations, such as the Loyal Nine. Membership was made up of males from all walks of life. It, the Sons of Liberty were notorious for recruiting tavern man managers, wharf rats, and other seedy characters, basically just looking to start trouble. The Boston Sons of Liberty would always meet under darkness, and they held meetings under the Liberty Tree, which was located in Hanover Square, the most public part of Boston. It was a 120-year-old elm tree with branches that, quote, seemed to touch the skies, according to the Boston Gazette. The New York Sons of Liberty met by the Liberty Pole. So there's a difference there. Taverns with sympathetic owners to the Patriot cause were the favorite meeting place for Sons of Liberty. I mean, we say with sympathetic owners, tavern, these owners were probably Sons of Liberty themselves. For example, the Boston chapter, they would meet at the Green Dragon Tavern most of the time. And here's the thing. Despite the lack of evidence and sources for the origins of the Sons of Liberty, Samuel Adams is often credited as being the founder slash leader of the organization. They were most likely organized in the summer of 1765 as a means to protest the passing of the Stamp Act in 1765. The motto was, no taxation without representation. Now I realized earlier I made a big deal about this. I thought I included it more. If you're taking a shot every time I say that, it's not a very fun drinking game. I apologize. Um, so let's 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 move on. This is a quote from the Boston Gazette. This article was written in 1765 by Samuel Adams, and he was referring to the anti sap activists. This is the first time they're referred to in print as Sons of Liberty. Quote, the Sons of Liberty on the 14th of August, 1765, a day which ought to be forever remembered in America, animated with a zeal for their country, then upon the brink of destruction and resolved at once to save her. Beautiful. I actually love the name Sons of Liberty. It's very, very beautiful and poetic. And it was actually derived from a debate in Parliament over the Stamp Act. So during this debate, Stamp Act supporter Charles Townsend made a disapproving statement about the American colonists. Irishman slash member of parliament, Isaac Barre, I did look it up, I'm really sorry, I'm doing my best. He stood and defended the colonists. He was reprimanded, actually, for positively speaking in favor of the colonists. And he called the colonists, quote, these sons of liberty. But here, again, here's the thing about our friend Isaac, okay? He was an Irishman, and as such, he shared many of the colonists' views, and so he was an advocate for their cause. He had served in North America as a colonel of the British Army during the French and Indian War. He knew what he was talking about. The debate took stock in the colonies, and this name, Sons of Liberty, was admirably used by the Patriot Organization. So... Let's talk about this. these guys. The first major action of the Sons of Liberty was carried out in Boston on August 14th, 1765, in response to our old friend, the Stamp Act. Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty gathered under our friend, the Liberty Tree, where effigies of Andrew Oliver, a public official in charge of enforcing the Stamp Act in Massachusetts, and related offenders of the people's liberties were hanging. Okay. That was a lot. I should have rewritten that. They gathered near the Liberty Tree. A picture of this dude and a whole bunch of other dudes in charge of enforcing things were hanging there. That's what happened. Incited by the Sons of Liberty, thousands of people gathered together and a sign was placed on the effigy of Andrew Oliver declaring, quote, he that takes this down is an enemy to his country. Bold statement. So the crowd was alcohol-fueled, angry, and riotous. They, so they proceeded to parade the effigy through the streets of Boston, inciting supporters of the Patriot cause throughout the city. So the mob is just getting bigger and bigger as they go throughout the city. So obviously the, the mob is, there's just a lot happening. 
So the effigy was stomped on, beheaded, and it was ultimately burned in a fit of anger. The, but the crowd wasn't done. No, no, no. Why stop at merely getting rid of the picture, essentially? Let's talk about what they did next. This crowd, led by the Sons of Liberty, marched on the home of Andrew Oliver. The fence of his home was torn down, windows were smashed, furnishings were destroyed, and the home was looted, most notably the wine cellar. Okay, but this is the sad part. Ironically, Andrew Oliver was privately not a supporter of the Stamp Act. He was just an obvious and easy, easy target for the people's anger. He was literally just doing his job, and his whole house got ruined because of it. Not cool. I'm just going to say it. Not cool. However, Andrew Oliver went on to resign on August 17th, three days later. And on December 17th, the Sons of Liberty made him publicly swear an oath that he would never again serve as a stamp master. Here's the thing. I really need to stop saying that. But here's the thing. We don't know if Samuel Adams was a part of this. But again, he was known as a leader of the Sons of Liberty. So perhaps he was there. But the, the Sons of Liberty were not finished. Nay, nay, nay. They next took their anger out on Andrew Oliver's brother-in-law who just happened to be a man named Thomas Hutchinson, who was the Lieutenant Governor and Chief Justice of Massachusetts. Keep his name in your head, Thomas Hutchinson, because he is very important to our whole story. So by the time of the Stamp Act, Hutchinson was already really not popular with the people of Boston because he was a known loyalist. A year earlier, he had published a history of Massachusetts condemning the 1689 revolt by Boston citizens against the rule of the then unpopular governor, Sir Edmund Andros. So he's just, he's just asking for it, essentially. He's in this politically radical place. People are not happy. And he's just publishing crap like this. I mean, I mean, come on, dude. Anyway, so on the evening of August 15th, 1765, the Sons of Liberty and others blockaded the Boston brick mansion of Thomas Hutchinson and demanded that he denounce the Stamp Act in his official letters to London. He refused. In response, 10, 11 days later, on the night of August 26th, a mob, once again organized by the Sons of Liberty, attacked his mansion. The front door was knocked down with axes, the interior was thoroughly looted and destroyed, including all of the beautiful woodwork. The garden was completely uprooted. I mean, it was, his home was completely destroyed. It was a very physical representation of, a, of the struggle between anti and pro Hutchinson supporters. It became this violent brawl that lasted throughout the entire night. And in addition to the scores of irreplaceable and costly damages all of his fine silver was taken 900 pounds sterling in cash which dude bro why you got that laying around your house and all of it was looted and carried off by the sons of liberty at the time it was estimated that there was 2200 pounds worth of damage hutchinson later received more than 3000 pounds from massachusetts as a reimbursement for the damages and he relocated himself and his family to Castle William in Boston Harbor. In 1767, the Sons of Liberty adopted a five red and four white vertical striped flag as the organization's formal standard. So this is two years later. This lets you know that they are, I mean, these, these houses they destroyed, these horrible things that they're doing, um, I mean, they're, they're just gaining momentum, okay? They're not stopping. Two years later, they're giving themselves a flag. So they were really, really influential in orchestrating effective resistance movements against British rule in colonial America, as we can already see. It was primarily against what they perceived as unfair taxation and financial limitations that were imposed upon them. So how did they undermine Britain besides destroying people's homes? Well, of course, the use of mob rule, tactics of fear, force, intimidation, and violence, such as tar and feathering, and the stockpiling of arms, 
shot, and gunpowder. The Sons of Liberty, as an organized group, disbanded at the end of the revolution, which I think is probably fine. As a political entity, they were replaced early in the revolution by more formal and qualified committees of safety. The committees of correspondence were established on the notion of diplomacy, and they served as a springboard for action. Remember, whereas the Sons of Liberty were an underground organization who operated in secret and used force, intimidation, and took physical action. The seminal act and lasting legacy of the Sons of Liberty to the history of the American Revolution was the orchestration of the Boston Tea Party on December 16th, 1773. My friends, the Boston Tea Party, the whole reason we're here today, was carried out by the Sons of Liberty, led by Samuel Adams. And as we know, this was a catalyst to the start of the war and a primary reason why the war began in Massachusetts. So we've come a really long way. We are an hour into our episode. We've done a lot of work. We've talked about a lot of things and a lot of people, and I would say established a pretty solid foundation for where we're at and what is going on in the colonies in general, and particularly in Boston. The Committee of Correspondence is doing all of its work, and others have formed all over the colonies, and behind them, the Sons of Liberty are working equally hard. So now, it's time to get to the main event. And in order to do so, we have to go back to taxes. So let's talk about the Tea Act. The Tea Act was passed by Parliament on May 10th, 1773, six months after the Boston Committee of Correspondence was formed, just to give you a little bit more of a solid sense of the timeline. This act granted the British East India Company a monopoly on tea sales in the American colonies. And my friends, this was the final straw for the colonists for the colonists, plural, not just one, um, in a series of unpopular, I think you could say, policies and taxes imposed by Britain. This policy ignited the powder keg, okay? And it just exploded the opposition and resentment among the colonists. It is important to note, however, that the Tea Act actually imposed no new taxes on the colonists. The tea tax had existed, remember, since the passing of the Townsend Revenue Act. And that was repealed. Remember, that was repealed three years later. However, the tea tax was kept in place. So the tax on tea had been in place this whole time. And the Tea Act wasn't changing anything about that. The Tea Act was not intended to anger the colonists. Instead, it was meant to be a bailout policy to get the British East India Company out of debt. Let's talk about it. The British East India Company was a really big deal, very important to the economy. Again, we could do a whole episode on that. In fact, we could probably do several episodes on the British East India Company. But again, this is a huge company, very, very important to the economy of the British Empire. So imagine if this company were to fail. It would do a lot of damage to an economy that was already struggling from debts from the war. So Parliament was like, hey, we probably shouldn't let this company go belly up. That would probably be bad. So the British East India Company had a massive amount of debt incurred primarily from annual contractual payments that were due to the British government totaling £400,000 per year. And that, my friends, is not adjusted for inflation, so can you even imagine? They were also suffering financially from unstable political and economic issues in India. The European markets were weak due to all the debts, etc. So, like, this company is not having fun anywhere. They're not having luck anywhere. Things are bad. So, besides the tax that was placed on tea back in the day with our friend the Townsend Revenue Act... What primarily angered colonists about the Tea Act was the monopoly that the British East India Company was given by the government. It was a government sanctioned monopoly and they were not, the colonists were not okay with that. Just for some reference, okay, 
Prior to the Tea Act, the British East India Company was required to exclusively sell its tea at auction in London. This required the company to pay a tax per pound of tea sold, which, as you can imagine, added to their financial burdens. So what did the Tea Act do? It aborted this restriction and granted the company license to export tea to the American colonies, basically giving the companies markets to the lucrative American colonies. Because remember, the only way they've been allowed to sell their tea up to this point is at auction in London. They haven't had access to the American market at all. So you can see how this would be a really big deal. Additionally, under the Tea Act, the duties that Britain charged on the company's tea shipped to the colonies would be waived or refunded upon sale. Again, huge bailout policy happening. So with the passing of the Tea Act, 17 million pounds of surplus tea could now be sold to the markets in the colonies. And it was shipped there and sold at a reduced rate. Again, remember, the Townsend Revenue Act tea tax was still in place at this time, despite all of the proposals to have it waived. And colonists were already outraged over the fact that they were being taxed over tea and the fact that it was not repealed like the rest of the taxes in 1770. They believed that the Tea Act was a tactic to gain colonial support for the tea tax that was already being enforced. So what happened? Well, I'll tell you, the direct sale of the tea by the British East India Company agents to colonies undercut the business of colonial merchants. How do you think our friends in the colonies felt about that? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you. Um, prior to the Tea Act, these merchants in the colonies had purchased tea directly from the British markets or smuggled it from illegal markets. Then it was shipped back to the colonies for resale, you know, capitalism. The colonists were, of course, outraged that the American merchants were being undercut. In fact, colonists in Philadelphia and in New York initially refused that the British East India Tea Company, excuse me, I'm getting too excited. Colonists in Philadelphia and New York refused for the tea from the British East India Company to be unloaded. And they said, no, my dude. And they just sent the ships right back to England. So this was a way to protest the Tea Act. And in many other colonial ports, the tea was unloaded, but it was just left untouched on the docks where it would just rot away. So here's the thing. The colonists resisted the tea tax and the tax on tea more because it violated the principle of self-government by consent more than because they couldn't afford the tax itself. Let's talk about that. Our very favorite person in the whole world, George Washington, the father of our country, said, quote, what is it we are contending against? It is, is it against paying the duty of three pence per pound on tea because it is burdensome? No, it is the right only that as Englishmen, we could not be deprived of this essential and valuable part of our constitution, end quote. Now listen, Besides the fact that wonderful George Washington said this, this concept is really, really important. And it's, it's important for a lot of different reasons. But the, here's the thing, everybody. The colonists, rightfully so, thought of themselves as Englishmen, right? They come from England, most of them, and they're an English colony. So they think of themselves as Englishmen. They understand the constitution that's in place. They understand their rights. And when they feel as though they are not being given the rights of your average Englishman, that's when things start to get hairy. And this is definitely already happening in the colonies at this point. So George Washington actually put it very succinctly. I'm going to read that again. No, it is the right only that as Englishmen, we could not be deprived of this essential and valuable part of our constitution. So do you remember a couple of minutes ago when I told you that we were now at the main event? I, I mean that this time. We have made it. We're at the main event. We are here at the Boston Tea Party. And if this episode has taught you anything, it should have taught you that nothing is as simple as it seems. So 
let's begin. The Boston Tea Party revolves around three ships that came into Boston Harbor in late November and early December of 1773. These ships were the Beaver, the Eleanor, and the Dartmouth. And each of these ships carried more than 100 chests of British East India Company black tea. Fun fact, there were actually supposed to be four ships, but the fourth ship, the William, ran aground off Cape Cod on December 10th in a storm. So unfortunately, they lost their tea too. <laughs> that was a bad joke. Okay, so the Dartmouth was the first ship to arrive, and it came into Boston Harbor on November 28th, 1773. Remember, we have our tax laws. So according to these laws, the tax on tea had to be paid the moment the tea was unloaded. And the absolute deadline for this was 20 days after the arrival of the tea, after which ships and cargoes were to be seized by authorities. This made it so that the deadline for the Dartmouth was December 17th, 1773. So immediately after the Dartmouth arrives in late November, the Sons of Liberty start distributing pamphlets all throughout Boston. And they said, quote, Friends, brethren, countrymen, the worst of plagues, capital P, the detested tea shipped for this port by the East India Company is now arrived in the harbor, capital H. The hour of destruction or, or manly opposition to the machinations of tyranny, capital T, stares you in the face, capital F. For the following 20 days, following the arrival of the Dartmouth, meetings occurred on a daily basis throughout Boston. And here was the question, what is to be done about this shipment of, quote, detested tea? These meetings were held at the Green Dragon Tavern and the Old South Meeting House. But let's talk about November 29th, 1773. This is the day after the Dartmouth arrives. And this meeting that happened on this day later became known as, quote, the body of the people. It was the very first large scale organized meeting to discuss the tea crisis. So what, what do you suppose is happening in Boston at this time? OK, it was already a hotbed of dissent and radicalism. OK, but people are genuinely probably more upset than they've ever been at this point. So. Thousands of men, women, and children had gathered from Boston and in the surrounding areas to meet together for this specific meeting. The Boston Committee of Correspondence and the Sons of Liberty organized this meeting, both of which were under the leadership of our boy, Samuel Adams. This meeting was attended by so many people that it had to be moved to the Old South Meeting House, which was the largest public building in Boston at the time, and thus became the central meeting place of the Patriot movement. Okay, so the resolves from this meeting were signed the people, which is a really big deal at this point. Okay, they're not the people are gathering together, which is just what the committees of correspondence and the Sons of Liberty were trying to do. So this is a direct result of all this work, right? So again, this meeting became known as the body of the people. Here, here we have the reintroduction of a, of a dude. Do you remember Lieutenant Governor slash Chief Justice of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, question mark? Yes. Here he is. He's back. Okay. He described the people as, quote, principally of the lower ranks of the people, and even journeymen tradesmen were brought in to increase the number and the rabble were not excluded, end quote. There is so much to unpack there, so I'm not going to try. The meeting regathered the next day, so now we're at November 30th, to give the tea consignees the opportunity to respond to what the body of the people had said. The tea consignee's son-in-law, John Singleton Copley, who happened to be a portrait artist, fun fact, he read the proposal of the tea consignees that was put together in response to this meeting. And the proposal was that they store the tea and that it could be inspected by the Sons of Liberty until they received further instructions from London. This proposal was, of course, booed and completely rejected by the thousands of people that were at this meeting. All of them agreed that it would still mean paying the tax because the tea would have to be unloaded in order to be stored. So 
it, re it really did nothing. A compromise couldn't be reached um, because the meeting was actually interrupted by a proclamation from Thomas Hutchinson, which stated that they needed to, quote, disperse and to surcease all further unlawful proceedings at your utmost peril, end quote. This order slash warning was not heeded, as you can probably imagine, okay? The people were not scared of him. The people responded, quote, as was solemnly voted by the body of the people of this and the neighboring towns assembled at the Old South Meeting House on Tuesday, the 30th of November, that the said tea never should be landed in this province, end quote. Just to drive this home, how people are really feeling about this, I'm going to read you another quote. This is from a letter by from Abigail Adams to her friend Mercy Warren, and this was on December 5th, 1773, so this is just a couple of days later. She wrote, quote, the tea, that baneful weed, is arrived. Great and effectual opposition has been made to the landing of it. To the public papers, I must refer you for particulars. You will there find that the proceedings of our citizens have been united, spirited, and firm. The flame is kindled, and like lightning, it catches from soul to soul. Great will be the devastation if not timely quenched or allayed by some more lenient measures. In other words, guys, stuff is it's heating up, and not in a good way. As you can probably imagine, tensions got even higher when the Eleanor and the Beaver arrived in Boston Harbor. So, with the arrival of these three ships, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver, carrying these tea cargoes, the Boston Committee of Correspondence was charged with managing the, quote, tea crisis. So, meetings held prior to the Boston Tea Party in November and December were organized by the Boston Committee of Correspondence and the Sons of Liberty. Samuel Adams called upon committees of correspondence from all throughout Massachusetts for support. He said to, quote, be in readiness for the, for the most resolute manner to assist this town in their efforts for saving this oppressed country, end quote. This is really strong language, you guys. And yes, I can hear what you probably are thinking. We're just talking about tea. Like, it, it's tea, right? No. It's much bigger than tea. And I hope that I have been able to illustrate the reason why in this episode. If I haven't, I have failed you, and I don't know how to apologize. Take my firstborn child, I guess. It is so much more than tea. Samuel Adams is literally calling on all these other committees to be in readiness to assist them in their efforts to save their oppressed country. This is more than tea, my friends. It has gone way past tea. So, what happens next? Under the order of Thomas Hutchinson, no vessel was allowed to leave Boston Harbor without a pass. The deadline to pay the tax for the Dartmouth was approaching. Remember, that was December 17th, was our deadline. Another large-scale meeting to discuss the tea crisis was planned for Tuesday, December 4th at the Old South Meeting House. Before this, smaller meetings had been held by the Sons of Liberty at the Meeting House every single day to discuss the tea crisis. And this is what they decided. If the crisis could not be resolved diplomatically through negotiations, the Sons of Liberty would have to come up with a course of action with the utmost secrecy. So, pamphlets are going crazy throughout Boston, right? And they are announcing meetings and they're calling forth concerned citizens to meet at 10 a.m. on December 14th at the Old South Meeting House. The news of this meeting spread to nearby towns throughout Massachusetts and they sent proclamations of support. Quote, Friends, brethren, countrymen, the perfidious act of your reckless enemies to render ineffectual the late resolves of the body of the people demands your assembling at the Old South Meeting House precisely at 10 o'clock this day, at which time the bells will ring, end quote. I have a more practical question. 
they're sending out these pamphlets, right? The, the meeting is scheduled, scheduled for 10 a.m. on December 14th. And the pamphlet says precisely at 10 o'clock this day, which means that they're distributing pamphlets before 10 a.m., which is fine. But like, how early, how early are we distributing pamphlets? Like, are we up with the bakers? Are like, are, what, uh, I, I have questions. And unfortunately, zero answers. Tuesday, December 14th, 1773. Thousands and thousands of people from Boston and nearby areas gathered together at the meeting house. Samuel Phillips of, oh, excuse me, Samuel Phillips Savage of Weston, Massachusetts was the chosen moderator of the meeting. And as with the earlier meetings, the consensus was to find a way to prevent all of the tea from being unloaded. Samuel Adams recorded, quote, the people met again at the Old South Church, and having ascertained the owner, they compelled him to apply at the Custom House for a clearance for his ship to London with the tea on board, and appointed ten gentlemen to see it performed, after which they adjourned till Thursday the 16th. End quote. Let me clarify. The owners of the Beaver, the Eleanor, and the Dartmouth have kind of found themselves caught in the middle of the tea crisis. I mean, it wasn't their fault. It was just kind of the way that it was. And this is what Samuel Adams is talking about. They're figuring, trying, they figure out who the owners of the ships are, and they're like, hey, it's partly your job to help us fix this. So the Beaver and the Dartmouth were owned by the Roch family of Nantucket, and the Eleanor was owned by a Boston merchant by the name of John Rowe. John Rowe and one Francis Roch were both present at this meeting and the captains of the Dartmouth and the Beaver were also present. The Patriots did not want the tea to be unloaded. That's really the only reason we're here. They don't want the tea to be unloaded. They want the ships to leave and go back to England with the tea without the payment of the tax. Thomas Hutchinson, our good friend, remember him? He wanted the tea immediately unloaded, the tax paid, and he wouldn't let the ships leave until the tea was unloaded. None of the owners or the captains wanted to risk damaging their ships by attempting to leave Boston without governmental permission, because if they attempted to leave, there was a huge risk of the ships being taken by the British warships that, that would probably fire upon them because they were guarding the fort at the entrance to Boston Harbor. So the ships and the owners and the crew awaited their fates, essentially. They're just kind of unfortunately caught in the middle of a lot of stuff, okay? So, December 16th, 1773, Thursday. The morning before the tax deadline. Thousands of people from all over Massachusetts gather in Boston. They're in the streets, they're at Griffin's Wharf, they're at the Green Dragon Tavern, and they're at the Old South Meeting House, okay? Everybody is there. And I think you could say that, at the very least, the atmosphere was a little bit tense. And the Sons of Liberty definitely took advantage of this. They roused the masses, okay? It is estimated that between 5,000 and 7,000 people gathered at the meeting house at 10 a.m. to resume the meeting that they had had a couple days before. Think about this, though, my friends. This crowd was more than one third of Boston's entire population at the time. It, it's, a, it's wild, okay? And it's even more wild when you consider the fact that a lot of these people are coming from all over Massachusetts. That's what a big deal this is. This is not just some tiny little thing we're dealing with here. So the deadline for the tax was midnight. So obviously a decision needs to be made and quickly. At the meeting, it was decided that Francis Roch and a committee would go to the Customs House to demand a pass for the Dartmouth to leave Boston Harbor. The officials at the Customs House, however, could not grant this demand because it wasn't in their authority to do so. So the meeting decided that Roch would make a personal plea to Thomas Hutchinson for permission for the Dartmouth to leave Boston without the tea being unloaded. The Patriots wanted to make their refusal of the tea as legitimate and legal as possible, which is something that I think 
we definitely don't talk about when it comes to the Boston Tea Party, something that we really don't know. I mean, it's how hard they tried to diplomatically and legally make things work. I think we all just see it as kind of this bold, crazy thing that happened. But it, what happened was really the last resort. And I think that it's important to understand that. So again, we're on we're at December 16th. Thomas Hutchinson was conveniently in Milton, Massachusetts, which was fairly close to Boston. So Roch traveled the 10 or more miles to Milton to meet with him to ask about the pass to leave the harbor. And um, Thomas Hutchinson said no. Surprise, surprise. Apparently, though, this meeting was really intense and there was, quote, spirited language. I bet there was. Thousands of people are just waiting around in Boston for hours for Roch to return with Thomas Hutchinson's answer. Can you imagine? It's like I'm just seeing thousands of people draped over various buildings waiting for one dude to just come riding into town. It's crazy. It's crazy. So again, John Rowe, the owner of the Eleanor, was said to have been at this meeting as well. And he was known for his smuggling and staunch anti-British policy leanings. So he was pretty upset at the whole situation. And he is recorded to have said, quote, perhaps salt water and tea will mix tonight, end quote. Foreshadowing. He is actually remembered as one of the insiders of the Boston Tea Party. And he actually attempted to cover up his participation in the planning by recording false entries in his diary as to his whereabouts on December 16th, which is crazy. I love it that back then you could just produce a diary and be like, look, my diary said I wasn't here. And they would be like, bet you didn't kill that person. Wild. Anyway, after many hours, Roch returned around 6 p.m. to the Old South Meeting House with Hutchinson's answer, which, as we know, was a very loud no. So now what? Now, what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. Time is running out, and the Patriots had exhausted all legal means to keep the ship from being unloaded. Since November 28th, the arrival of the Dartmouth, now maybe you didn't know this, in fact, I know you didn't know this, the Sons of Liberty had all along been secretly planning a last resort alternative measure to prevent the tea from being unloaded if all diplomatic negotiations with government officials failed. And our boy, Thomas Hutchinson, was the final word in regard to colonial policy in Massachusetts. So when he refused the pass, Samuel Adams said, quote, this meeting can do nothing more to save the country. He addressed the whole crowd of thousands of people with these words. And everybody was shouting and cries of huzzah were heard and also make Boston Harbor a teapot tonight was also heard lots and lots of war whoops so listen what happens next the sons of liberty dressed in their best interpretation of quote Indian dress Native American dress left the meeting house they mustered at Fort Hill and marched on Griffin's Wharf an eyewitness by the name of John Andrews he was a merchant. He described the events to a Philadelphia merchant in a letter two days later. And he said, quote, They mustered, I'm told, upon Fort Hill to the number of about 200 and proceeded two by two to Griffin's Wharf, where Hall, Bruce, and Coffin lay. He, he's talking about the ships. Those are the names of the captains. Each with 114 chests of the ill-fated article on board. And before nine o'clock in the evening, every chest from on board the three vessels was knocked to pieces and flung over the sides. They say the actors were Indians from Narragansett. Whether they were or not, to a transient observer they appeared to be such, being clothed in blankets with the heads muffled and copper-colored countenances, being each armed with a hatchet or axe and pair pistols. End quote. So reports from the time describe the participants as dressed as Mohawks or Narragansett Indians. It is really, 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 really important that we talk about this. Because um, 
I've discovered something incredibly, incredibly important. Listen, everybody. I'm an American. Shocker. When I was taught about the Boston Tea Party growing up, I was taught that the men dressed up as Native Americans in order to conceal their identities, in order to make the British think that it was the Native Americans who were destroying the tea. That is what I was actually taught in my actual school, in my actual education. You guys, this is not the truth. That is blatantly false, actually. This quote-unquote disguise was actually symbolic. These men knew that they would be recognized as non-Native Americans because their dress wasn't that great, okay? The act of wearing this dress was to express the fact that the colonists now identified themselves as Americans and not British subjects. How do we know this? I will tell you. They were not dressed as Native Americans in the classic sense. They didn't have headdresses. They did not have full authentic regalia. They wore blankets in the match coat style. They painted their faces with soot. And they, they used other modes of dress known at the time as, quote, Indian dress that had been adopted by soldiers during the French and Indian War. It's just a costume. And like every other costume, it's sending a message and telling a story. Please remember that. It's very, very important. A man by the name of George Hughes dictated his participation years later, and he said of his costume, quote, It was now evening, and I immediately dressed myself in the costume of an Indian, equipped with a small hatchet, which I and my associates denominated the tomahawk, with which, and a club, after having painted my face and hands with coal dust in the shop of a blacksmith, I repaired to Griffin's Wharf, where the ships lay that contained the tea. When I first appeared in the street after being thus disguised, I fell in with many who were dressed, equipped, and painted as I was, and who fell in with me and marched in order to the place of our destination. Hundreds of people participated in the Boston Tea Party. We, we, you probably knew that. What you might not have known is that thousands of people witnessed it. Do you remember all those people that just came into town because things were crazy? They all just stood and watched. They did. I'm not kidding. And I love it. And many participants actually remained anonymous for several years for fear of punishment. It's wild because actually, you know what? We'll get into it later. We'll get into it later. But John Adams actually later said he didn't know the identity, the identity of any participant. Which, again, we'll get into that later. As of today, 116 people are documented as participants. Although many carry the secret of their participation to their graves, because we know there were more than that. Males from all walks of colonial life participated in this. And many participants were from Boston, of course, but also the surrounding areas. Some are documented to have come from as far come from as far away as Worcester, Massachusetts, and Maine. The vast majority of these men were, of course, of English descent. However, men of Irish, Scottish, French, Portuguese, and African ancestry are also all documented. Participants were of all ages, mostly under 40. There were 16 teenagers and only nine men over the age of 40. And again, this is just of the people that we have officially documented to have participated. So we're here. We're destroying tea, guys. It's December 16th, 1773. 340 chests of British East India Company tea, weighing over 92,000 pounds on the Dartmouth, the Beaver, and the Eleanor, were smashed open by the Sons of Liberty, armed with an assortment of axes, and dumped into Boston Harbor. The British East India Company reported 9,659 pounds worth of damage, which is more than $1.7 million today. Which, you know, that's, that's going to hurt. Merchant John Andrews wrote, quote, 10,000 pounds sterling of the East India Company's tea was destroyed that night. End quote. But guys, there is so much 
listen, this is insane, okay? Besides the destruction of the tea itself, every single account, every single record records that no damage was done to any of the ships, any of the crew, or any other items on board except one broken padlock. This padlock was the personal property of one of the ship's captains, and it was promptly replaced the very next day by the Patriots. Very, very great care was taken by the Sons of Liberty to not destroy any property but the tea. That was very, very important. One ship had a lot more cargo on it than tea, and all of that cargo was completely undisturbed and fine. Nothing was stolen or looted from the ships, not even the tea. There was one participant who tried to steal some tea, and he was reprimanded and he stopped. The Sons of Liberty were incredibly particular about how this action was carried out, about the fact that nothing but the tea could be damaged, because we're sending a message here, right? So after the tea was destroyed, the participants swept the ship's decks clean, and anything that was moved was put back in its proper place. And the crews of these ships attested over and over again that nothing but the tea was damaged. Now, if you'll remember our participant George Hughes, he said, quote, The commander of the division to which I belonged ordered me to go to the captain and demand of him the keys to the hatches and a dozen candles. I made the demand accordingly, and the captain promptly replied and delivered the articles, but requested me at the same time to do no damage to the ship or rigging. We then were ordered by our commander to open the hatches and take out all the chests of tea and throw them overboard, and we immediately proceeded to execute his orders, first cutting and splitting the chests with our tomahawks so as thoroughly to expose them to the effects of the water. In about three hours from the time we went on board, we had thus broken and thrown overboard every tea chest to be found in the ship, while those in the other ships were disposing of the tea in the same way at the same time. We were surrounded by British armed ships, but no attempt was made to resist us." End quote. Right after the Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams starts spreading the news of it through all of the committees of correspondence networks all over the colonies. Okay, it is it is going, okay? In letters as early as December 17th, the very next day, Adams reported on the Boston Tea Party, and he emphasized that the destruction of the, quote, detested tea, end quote, took place, quote, without the least injury to the vessels or any other property. Again, property rights are very important, and it was one of, these rights were actually one of Adams' main arguments against British taxation. Again, this is the reason why they made such a big deal out of the fact that the only damage that was done was to the tea itself. John Adams wrote to James Warren the next day, quote, The die is cast. The people have passed the river and cut away the bridge. Last night, three cargoes of tea were emptied into the harbor. This is the grandest event which has ever yet happened since the controversy with Britain opened. So I just really, really love that quote from that letter from John Adams because it shows, I just squeaked, my, my S just whistled. That was crazy. Anyway, it shows just how big of a deal the Boston Tea Party was. People weren't just upset. People weren't just, you know, protesting or, or something. Like they were doing big things. It was the kind of thing that can't be ignored. It's kind of a turning point. And it's so exciting, to be honest. It's really exciting. So remember our participant, George Hughes. He has another quote we're going to read. Quote, We then quietly retired to our several places of residence without having any conversation with each other or taking any measures to discover who were our associates. There appeared to be an understanding that each individual should volunteer his services, keep his own secret, and risk the consequences for himself. No disorder took place during the, that transaction, and it was observed at that time that the stillest night ensued that Boston had enjoyed for many months. Can we talk about that? Okay, Boston had been boiling over, freaking out for like years at this point, but especially the last couple months. 
and they go and they freaking destroy 92,000 pounds of tea and then everybody just like goes home and chills and remember the tax deadline was actually midnight so they got this done all by about 9 p.m so like they still had time to go home and like watch an episode of the office and chill that's it that's what happened they all went home and watched the office which i love it's so incredible that after this huge act of rebellion it was just quiet everybody just went home and went about their normal lives it's really 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 interesting but let's continue so there was only ever one member of the sons of liberty that was caught and imprisoned for his involvement in the boston tea party and that was a man by the name of francis akeley i believe that's how you say it he was actually the only person to ever be arrested for the boston tea party no one died there was no violence there was no confrontation between Patriots, Tories, or British soldiers garrisoned in Boston. None of the members of any of the crews of any of the ships were harmed. Again, it was a very organized, planned execution of an act. I don't know why I said it like that. It. I just really want to drive home that it wasn't just this brazen thing they did in anger. They definitely did it in anger, but it was planned and there was no violence. It was, again, the first organized act of rebellion against British rule, and the Sons of Liberty were wanted to be really, really careful about how it was planned and executed for that reason, because I think you have to understand that that's going to set the tone for everything that comes after. So John Adams said, quote, This is the most magnificent movement of all. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the patriots that I greatly admire. This destruction of the tea is so bold, so daring, so firm, so intrepid, and so inflexible, and it must have so important consequences and so lasting that I cannot but consider it as an epoch in history. So, let's get back to our friend Paul Revere. He rode to Manhattan and arrived on December 21st to deliver the news of the Boston Tea Party, to the New York Committee of Correspondence. And Boston, the Boston Committee of Correspondence sent the following message to them. Quote, we had a greater meeting of the body than ever, the country coming in from 20 miles around, and every step was taken that was practicable for returning the teas. The moment it was known out of doors that Mr. Roch could not obtain a pass for his ship by the castle, a number, a number of people huzzahed in the street and in very little time, every ounce of the teas on board of Captain Hall, Bruce, and Coffin was immersed in the bay. Without the least injury to private property, the spirit of the people on this occasion surprised all parties who viewed the scene. Let's talk about how beautiful that is. Again, I love it that there are so many firsthand accounts that all say the same thing. That's very rare with a firsthand account of anything but uh, we're all saying the same thing right i've read quite a few things and all of them are saying just how incredible it was and how peaceful which is crazy but let's talk about the more practical side of things for weeks after the boston tea party boston harbor smelled really bad as a result of all of that tea being in the salt water which makes sense. And to keep looters from salvaging the tea, the Sons of Liberty went out in boats and they would hit the tea with oars and clubs in an attempt to make it sink and render it useless because some of it inevitably floated to the top. Because what does a tea bag do? It floats, right? We're going to talk, we're going to say another quote from George Hughes. He said, quote, The next morning after we had cleared the ships of the tea, it was discovered that very considerable quantities of it were floating upon the surface of the water and it prevented oh and to prevent the possibility of any of its being saved for use a number of small boats were manned by sailors and citizens who rowed them into those parts of the harbor wherever the tea was visible and by beating it with oars and paddles so thoroughly drenched it as to render its entire destruction inevitable i just love the way they talk because he's like, yeah, we just, he's not, like, essentially he's saying, yeah, we just beat it till it, you know, it was done. But 
thoroughly drenched it as to render its entire destruction in inevitable. I love it. I love it. So I can hear you asking me, okay, so this is like the, the very immediate aftermath of the Boston Tea Party in Boston. But what happens when the news gets to London? Well, I'm going to tell you, the news of the Boston Tea Party didn't reach London for another month because, you know, the 1700s of it all. It reached London on January 20th, 1774. And guess what, my friends? Parliament was a little bit upset. And by that, I mean, Parliament was a lot a bit upset. Boston Harbor was immediately shut down until all 340 chests of tea were paid for. This was implemented under the 1774 Intolerable Acts, and this was known as the Boston Port Act. The Intolerable Acts, we are going to talk about them, just give me a second. They were a series of acts that the British imposed as a response to the Boston Tea Party. They were the Massachusetts Government Act, the Administration of Justice Act, the Quartering Act, and the Quebec Act. And the answer to your question is a resounding yes. They were, in fact, a doozy. Because, again, Parliament was a little upset. So let's talk about these, the Intolerable Acts. Now, officially, they were named the Coercive Acts. And, again, they were passed in 1774. These acts were Parliament's very mature... <laughs> I actually don't know what to call it. Not great. Um, but I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot going on here. Let's just continue. These acts were Parliament's response to the Boston Tea Party. So let's start from the top. The Boston Port Act, and again, these are a group of acts together, right? The Boston Port Act closed Boston Harbor to trade until restitution was made for the tea. The Massachusetts Government Act banned town meetings and placed the legislature under greater royal control, which, holy moly, my friends, I think that that's probably the most hardcore one. Parliament said, oh, you're going to meet together as a town and, like, come after us? JK, let's ban town meetings, which is actually hysterical because then the American colonists were like, LOL, watch me have a town meeting. That's what happened verbatim. I was there. And then we have the Impartial Administration of Justice Act, which I love it that it's called that. Like, there's no bias there at all. The Impartial Administration of Justice Act. This allowed British officials to be tried in England for capital crimes, escaping colonial justice and local juries. Very impartial justice, that. Let's talk about the Quartering Act. This required the housing of troops in unoccupied buildings and homes. I was going to talk about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, but that's probably, that's a story for another time. And also, remember our friend Thomas Hutchinson? He was actually replaced by British General Thomas Cage. Now listen. Oh, excuse me, Thomas Gage. So Thomas Hutchinson was nobody's favorite guy, right? But at least he was a native-born Boston civilian who understood his city and his people. This new dude was not that. Gage's instructions were to enforce the coercive acts and prosecute the leaders of the resistance. Pretty hardcore stuff. The colonists labeled these new laws the intolerable acts because they systematically abridged the liberties that were held sacred and inviolable by the colonists. Here's the thing, everybody. If the destruction of the tea was illegal, which it strictly was, but the colonists are saying this, if the destruction of the tea was illegal, then the responsible individuals should be brought to trial. Group punishment was unacceptable and completely abhorrent to the rule of law, which is very true. The coercive acts essentially trampled economic liberty, the right of self-government by their own consent and elections, right to a trial by jury, and a right to their own property. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. All along, the colonists had insisted on, on enjoying the full liberties of free English people because that's what they were. But now, it seemed that they were being ruled as conquered foreigners. And this did not sit well with anyone. From New England to the Lower South, the coercive acts enraged colonists and 
made them even more together against their common foe. George Washington said, quote, the cause of Boston now is and ever will be considered as the cause of America. This gives you an even bigger sense of why this is such a big deal and how Boston is kind of acting for the country and how, I mean, Washington said it himself, the cause of Boston is now the cause of America. And the members of the Virginia House of Burgesses concurred. Their Williamsburg Assembly was dissolved by their royal governor, Lord Dunmore, which they just reconvened down the street at a tavern. Good for them. They then declared themselves the people's representatives and announced that, quote, an attack made on one of our sister colonies to compel submission to arbitrary taxes is an attack made on all British America and threatens ruin to the rights of all. I just want to clap so loud for the unity that is happening because, I mean, you can't have any kind of revolution without some unity. And the, the, the unity is coming, not in great ways, but it just shows that from the outset, all of the colonies really were together. And that one thing that happened, happened to them all. I think that's so important to understand. Because I think we think of the colonies as kind of these individual things that existed. And in many ways they were. But this unity is really important. So back to these dudes, the Virginia House of Burgesses. They then called for a boycott on British imports and asked other colonies to send delegates to a continental congress. Representatives from 12 colonies proceeded to meet at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1774 to declare the rights of the people and refuse British trade. American colonists responded to British policies with um, protests and coordinated resistance by convening the very first Continental Congress in September and October of 1744, almost a year after the Boston Tea Party, to petition Britain to repeal the Intolerable Acts, because they were the worst. And again, this isn't some temporary committee. I say again a lot, I haven't said this before. Let me start over. They're forming the first Continental Congress, right? And this isn't some temporary committee. This isn't even a committee that's gonna start spreading throughout the colonies, like the Committees of Correspondence. This is a meeting of representatives from all over the colonies. It's, if it wasn't already real, it is real now. Things are getting real. And I wanna, um, what am I trying to say? Repeat, that's the word. I wanna repeat this quote from George Washington because I just think it's really important. Quote, the cause of Boston now is and ever will be considered as the cause of America. So, This leads to, again, the first Continental Congress that was in Philadelphia in September and October of 1774 to repeal, to ask Britain to repeal the Intolerable Acts. But I'm afraid that the first Continental Congress is a story for another time. So I think it is incredibly safe to say that we have come a really long way today. We came here to learn about the Boston Tea Party. And not only did we learn about the event itself, but we learned about the people, the events, and the organizations that led the American colonists to this first rebellious act. Honestly, I hope that if nothing else, you've learned how the Boston Tea Party was so much more than a bunch of angry people throwing tea into the ocean. Because even though it was a bunch of angry people throwing tea into the ocean, it was also symbolic on every level and a true act of independence that paved the way for the American colonies to become an independent nation. Without the people of Boston and their willingness to act, it's really hard to say how things would have gone for the colonists moving forward. We have a lot to thank Boston for. We have the Boston Tea Party to thank them for. We have the American Revolution. We have Ash and Elena and a lot of other things. And it's beautiful, okay? I hope, honestly, truly I hope that you learned something from this episode and had as much fun as I did. I've heard about the Boston Tea Party my whole life, okay? I knew about it from day one, pretty much. But it wasn't until 
Sorry, I just hit my microphone. It wasn't until, oh my gosh, I hit it again. I'm so sorry. Give me a second. Let me regroup. It wasn't until this episode that I really, truly learned everything that the Boston Tea Party was and all that it symbolized. And here's a funny story that I'm going to tell you. When I was living in London doing my master's degree, I was there on the 4th of July. And the really intriguing thing is that I never feel as staunchly American as I do when I'm in England. (laughs) And especially on the 4th of July, it was like this feral American beast came out in me and I made my Italian friend Eugenia come with me and we had a whole American day. And it was beautiful. I took her to the Benjamin Franklin house. We ate Texas ribs. It was great. We watched Top Gun. We ate cornbread. And most of all, we went to Tower Bridge and threw bags of tea into the Thames River. And now that I've done this episode, I'm even more grateful that I did that than I already was, which is saying something because I was really proud of myself for doing that. Eugenia was terrified and thought we were going to get arrested, which we probably could have. But I figured that if I was ever going to get arrested, it should be in London on the 4th of July, throwing tea into the river. I figured that that was probably okay. So I'm going to leave you off with that. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here with me today and for hanging out with me and for coming on this journey. It was a long journey. But again, I had so much fun. This episode was very heavy on research and on writing, and it worked my historian muscles a lot. But I am really, really grateful for that chance because they've been dormant for a while and they needed some exercising and it felt really good. So thank you forever. I love you guys so, so much. So much. You can give me a follow on Instagram at notstrictlyhistory underscore podcasts. Or you can send me a Gmail at notstrictlyhistory at gmail.com if you want to just say hi or request an episode or any number of things. I don't know. Give me a holler if you want. And I'll see you next week on Not Strictly History. Cheerio, friends.